Some good conversations this morning, uh, a bit of it to do with politics, some US politics later on. Gosh, that's uh, heating up to be an interesting um, contest. Meanwhile, back here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, some... Um, some politicians behaving badly, which, uh, again, perhaps no surprises there. Joining us on the programme now, political commentator and director of the Democracy Project, uh, Dr Bryce Edwards. Bryce, kia ora, good morning. Maureen and Andrew. On the top of the naughty list, as we get um, disturbingly close to Christmas, Andrew Bailey, that just, well, honestly, just, just couldn't keep his mouth shut on this one. I mean, what w- unpack what actually happened and in your opinion, what is an apology good enough for, uh, or is this going to do permanent damage to his career and credibility? Yes. Yeah, so this is the the small business and manufacturing minister Andrew Bailey. He was on a ministerial visit um, oh, a week or so ago to uh, a Marlborough uh, winery and places in in Blenheim, and um, one of the workers at one of his sites uh, got upset with some interaction he had with the minister yep. and he complained about it. He alleges that the the minister called him a, a loser and supposedly did the owl shape, you know, symbol on the forehead. I, yeah. I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> uh, and, um, and he, uh, he told the worker to take some wine and, and to head off yep. using a, a some swear words. Yep. Uh, and so the worker accused him of being, um, yeah, toxic and intoxicated, mm. I guess. Whereas Andrew Bailey has um, come out and apologised for his behaviour and said he's let down uh, the, the team. And he, uh, he, he's he been pretty uh, apologetic, but he's disputed some elements of it, yep. disputed the swearing, disputed the... Um, that he had had any alcohol and had framed it as him being lighthearted um, and banter. Um, and wow. so we don't really know what the truth is, but there has uh, certainly been lots of condemnation. And we've had the prime minister also um, apologise for him as well, but in the view of uh, the government's critics, not really being tough enough on yeah. what is seen as bad behaviour. And, and hey, um, honestly... My first question was going to be, who is Andrew Bailey? This isn't a great start to your political oh. career. The uh, the first headline that you make is drunk and swearing at a uh, a vineyard worker, um, whether or not that actually happened. And and I think the thing there's there's an issue of character here as well because I think you can you can tell a lot about a person's character as to how they behave to people who aren't in positions of power that can do them a favour, perhaps. Um, something has been exposed of Andrew Bailey's character that he would prefer to keep secret. Look, look, that's the big issue. And to what extent this represents, you know, the National Party as well. Um, you know, the National Party's changed a lot over the years. And, you know, um, you know it used to be the the party of, you know, the, um, the more elite who looked down their noses at people and was very conservative. And, you know, it's, it's tried to change over the years. Yep. So people like John Key tried to modernise it. And I don't know if you remember, there was um, there was an, another scandal oh, about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I just suddenly forget the MP's name, who, you know, allegedly got drunk in a Hamner um, uh, conference and you know, demanded off the waiter, don't you know yes. who I am? Yeah. Um, and you no, know, and Key fired him and, and pushed him out of Parliament for mm-hmm. that to really try and get across. No, we're not that party anymore. And so that's the danger here. That it looks entitled. It looks um, like you know he's an elite. Yeah. So yeah. So I think it is bad for his career and bad for National. But you know, there's a lot of people saying, well, hey, we're getting this out of proportion. Um, yes, he behaved badly, but you know, let's let's focus on the big issues. And he has apologised. Um, I mean, Andrew Bailey has been generally viewed as a, as a good minister, mm-hmm. not a star. But someone that's quietly been working quite hard. So I, I think he'll go back to working quite hard and he just needs to make sure this doesn't happen again. And ironically, he is the loser in this situation. There's, I don't Indeed. think there's any debate Indeed. about that, whichever way you want to put the L around on your forehead. Somebody else who's in the headlines for the wrong reasons, and uh, Aisha Verrill, of course, the health spokesperson for Labour, 
Now, uh, this is a golden opportunity, I suppose, because there are so many issues with health and budgets and blowouts and, and cutbacks, etc. This could be her moment to shine if it weren't for the fact that there's supposedly a conflict of interest with a relative of hers. Yes, look, I'm not sure to what extent uh, Labour's Asia Vero herself is under too much scrutiny here, yeah. but um, it's a complicated um, mini scandal. Uh, it's not a huge one, but of course, tobacco reforms have been one of the most contentious um, of, of this government's reforms. And Casey Costello, uh, the New Zealand First Minister, has been pushing these things through, which yep. is seen as, um, yeah, pushing back against what a lot of Labour did um, in, in that space last term. And, um, you know, there's been allegations about Casey Costello, uh, her integrity issues, but now the, the boot's on the other foot mm. because it turns out that Aisha Verrill's sister-in-law works in the Ministry of Health um, and she's one of the people that has been briefing and working on the policies for Casey Costello. Wow. And so, um, and Casey Costello didn't know this. Um, and so, you know, last week in, in, in the debating chamber, uh, was it earlier this week? I forget, time's gone a bit strange for me, yeah. Andrew. But yeah. um, Winston Peters raised this and pointed out about this public servant being the sister-in-law of Aisha Verrill and how outrageous this was that, uh, that Casey Costello wasn't informed about this. And it turns out that the the public servant themselves had informed their bosses at the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. um, and cleared this conflict of interest, and it's the Ministry of Health that didn't act on that oh. and informed the minister. And so it's it's the Ministry of Health, really, that's that's um, in trouble here for doing things wrong. And there's you know, perhaps a bit of a need for a review of their processes to make sure that um, you know, they are transparent with the ministers about who's working for them. And especially because, I mean, Asheville has been quite combative um, yeah. with Casey Costello about this particular issue. So if anybody was thinking, oh, gosh, I wonder what her source is, maybe we've we've spotted the leak, although that's purely speculative. Just wanting to, exactly. to, to say that no, out is. loud. Yeah. It, it is that, but that's what people will be thinking. And so it does, does everyone a bit of a disservice um, when these things aren't transparent. Yeah. So if ministers... The Ministry of Health had told Casey Costello it, and it had been, had been public, then people can make up their own minds without it being, uh, and it might have been, you know, the minister might have asked someone else to be in that role, yeah. et cetera. But, um, you know, you need to have transparency. On and, and hey, surely uh, A. Shavira was um, aware of it and could have done something about it in, in that regard. And, and, and with um, one thing we've learned from... Um, uh, the recent incidents with um sorry I just forgotten the name there of the the Green Party MP who's been ousted. Oh, uh, Darlene you Tana. Yeah, Darlene yeah. Tana. You don't need to be the one who's in trouble. If your relative gets in trouble, that can get you kicked out yeah. of Parliament. If 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 you, you don't uh, own up to it sooner rather than that's, later. That's a very good point, actually. Yes, you're right. Now, um, if just finally on this one, and gosh, this is fascinating. Uh, capital gains tax not only back in the headlines but making some difference when it comes to polling. Of course, the uh, the Labour government said, oh, yeah, now that we're no longer the Labour government, capital gains tax seems to be a really good idea, which, I mean, there's a little bit of hypocrisy and, uh, gosh, why didn't you think of this earlier with that statement? But it seems to have given them a nudge in the polls regardless. Oh, look, yes. Um, Labour's trying to reinvent itself and find a way forward. Uh, and there's a certain faction of the Labour Party, more on the left, that want to revisit tax reform to deal with inequality, to uh, deal with a lot of economic issues. And so they're pushing for that. And there was a, a survey company, a research company, Ipsos, that uh, carried out polling on uh, this, amongst other things, that and, and put out their report, I think it was yesterday, um, and the report claimed that 66% or thereabouts of the population are uh, in some form open to a capital gains tax. So that was quite a big shift because, of course, Labour in the past have said, oh, we don't have the public support for it, yep. um, and that's why people like Ardern and Hipkins you know, ruled it out. Um, but supposedly there is support, except 
that um, this poll, the way it was reported, wasn't actually entirely accurate. Okay. And so, um, so RNZ, the Herald, have reported it as having two thirds support for a capital gains tax. But once you drill into the questions and look at them, it's not actually that clear. Yeah. They asked a number of different questions: Would you support? capital gains on um, investment property? Would you support a capital gains tax on the family home and all these different things? Yeah. And the highest for any single one of those was 57%. Mm. And that was people supporting it on property sales. Um, but it was much lower for everything else. And so what the news reports had added together some of these different um, totals, <laughs> which I don't think is really It's robust. not great maths to to add together no. percentages, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And particularly when there's overlap there. One of the things which is more interesting, I suppose, is that uh, we were talking about this a few weeks ago. The mood of the boardroom also said that a capital gains tax would be something that they would be into exploring. So a general um, mood change here. And I, I think what's significant, you mentioned um, – the last couple of prime ministers, uh, Labour prime ministers, were again it and said that wouldn't happen under their watch. But there is um, perhaps still support from that amongst senior Labour leaders, one of whom I have in mind in particular could be the next Labour leader. Look, yeah, David Parker has yep. pushed this for a long time and uh, and he knows his stuff um, and, you know, he had he resigned from the portfolio, the Brave New portfolio in the lead up to last election over Chris Hipkins ruling it out, essentially. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I think there is going to be a lot more debate about capital gains taxes um, now and not just in Labour. Um, but yeah, as you pointed out, business people are suggesting uh, it is a good idea. And it is common in other, very common in other countries. Mm -hmm. And businesses generally are in favour of having some taxation on these things, especially if it means that you can do it in a, 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 a tax neutral way. Yep. So if you bring on a capital gains tax, you then reduce, say, company tax or income taxes. And so there's a lot of businesses that say, we don't want it as an additional tax. We want it to replace other taxes. And so there's lots of debates about you know, and, how to configure these things. And from a fairness point of view, it's arguable that people that are getting most of their income from capital gains aren't paying any tax at all, and that oh, may seem absolutely. unfair uh, yeah. to to, uh, to cut to the chase on that one. Uh, but interesting yeah. to see how this one goes now that it's perhaps been, I mean, the percentage is a bit wobbly, but it's shown to not be political suicide, at least, to propose this as a platform. It may be the way back that Labor's been looking for. Oh, look, I think so. I, I, I think Labour's on to a winner here. But don't be surprised if other parties do pick it up. And they won't necessarily just be the, the parties of the left. Um, I mean, there, there's people in national that like this idea too. So I, I don't see Chris Luxon being particularly keen on it. But yeah. there's others. And, um, you know, whatever government whatever colour of government's in power, they do need to think about tax reform. The current system does, I think everyone agrees, isn't actually the optimal one. So there's going to have to be tax reform one way or another. Hey, appreciate your comments and insight as always. Bryce, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, thanks very much for joining us in the Rima studio. Thanks very much for watching the interview. It's kind of nice to have an audience, actually. And if you did like what you watched, then do give us a like, do give us the thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more interviews like that one, or perhaps even better, subscribe and those interviews will come straight to you. Don't forget to turn on your notifications and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.